Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, featuring interviews that take us deeper into the people and happenings on the local scene. For more podcasts and a closer look at what's going on in the Valley, visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Hi, my name is Dave Eisenstatter. I'm editor of the Valley Advocate, and welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast. I am here with our staff writer, Meg Bantel. Hi. And uh, today we have a, a guest, Karima Rizk, who is the owner of Cafe Bear in East Hampton. Thank you. Thank yes, you for welcome. coming. Thank you. It's so exciting to be here. <laughs> yeah, great. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, uh, kind of how you got started in the cafe business in, in the first place. Certainly. Well, um, I think uh, I used to work in medical marijuana here in Massachusetts and Spencery, and one thing I noticed that was missing was the energy. Um, a lot of people had serendipitous meetings and conversations, and they learned a lot. But you really can't hang out in a dispensary and, and keep the conversation going, and you can't plan to meet your friends there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to create a safe, stigma-free space um, not really a stoner stereotype, but something classy, something appealable um, to the broader public, and also socially responsible, something we can be proud of. Um, I'm also focusing on a community-oriented model. Uh, I want to keep my economic impact local, so as much as possible, I try to source vendors, food, um, contracts, all those sorts of things, as much as possible. Starting my home city of East Hampton, and then keeping it in the Pioneer Valley, Western Massachusetts. Um, I'm also really excited about something really innovative, which is I want to bring on community owners from the public in my in my um, venture, Mm. Cafe Bear. What what does that what does that mean, like a community owner? So to launch Cafe Bear, um, I need to get investment money, and even in in categories of uh, cannabis, such as ancillary services, parts that don't touch the plant we're cut off from getting loans or grants from mm-hmm. banks. Mm. Um, people are really reluctant to even associate it. And there's still a stigma, mm-hmm. um, whether or not we want to realize it or acknowledge it. So many times, people who join this broad industry have to get financial backing from private investors. So before I go ahead and try to raise money through private investors, I want to invite the local community to be investors and have priority to that uh, access of stock and capital. Right. Do you feel like you have a lot of community support so far? Um, I have been incredibly blessed. Um, I love my hometown of East Hampton. Um, It's a wonderful, vibrant town with so much possibility. And I've started my search and my exploration for this venture there. And I really did find both the community support and the political will the municipal government has been excellent in helping me. And I think, broadly speaking, a lot of people want to see me succeed and want to see something like this come to the Pioneer Valley. It's a really good fit. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in this kind of social aspect. You were talking about working in the um, dispensary and how these conversations were almost trying to happen, but there wasn't space for them to do it. I mean, kind of what's the, what do you see as the importance of that social side of the, um, you know, just people who are cannabis users, medical or otherwise. Absolutely. And I think um, even in, in your mentioning that, I think we should even include non-cannabis users mm. in that. Um, and really it's creating a safe space where people, go, adults particularly, this will be 21 plus, can come and have open, honest conversations um, about cannabis, about hemp, get factual, evidence-based information or experiential-based information, get access to classes, really good quality programming, especially in Western Massachusetts. Right now, you can go to conferences and shows and classes out east in Boston, but out in Western Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. it's really kind of like a desert land in the cannabis industry. Um, Yeah. Yeah, and Meg, you just wrote um, a great story about the um, the CCC, the Control Commission, um, uh, moving forward with some kind of um, uh, like the blueprint for how it's going to look and that um, cannabis cafes were not a part of that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, that's right. So the just on Tuesday, the Cannabis Control Tuesday, March 6th, um, the CCC and Mass uh, finally voted on their regulations. And while we don't have our hands on those regulations quite yet, um, it does mean that the debating and public uh, hearing period is over. So what they decided at a meeting last week was that the cannabis um, coffee house and uh, licenses that would allow for social 
cannabis use in other places too. Like people were getting really excited about cannabis yoga studios mm. and movie theaters and all these things that you might uh, be more familiar with in like Amsterdam. Um, those the CCC have decided to put off those licenses for. Uh, I think they said next February, a year from now, they might have a draft. But of course, given how regulations work, you know, I, I, I hope that they're being honest. But it's it's hard to say if that is. Uh, in, in any case, it's not exactly a, a good sign. <laughs> yeah, but that would have been first in the nation. Is first that right? First in the nation. Yeah. Yep. Um, even though other states have licenses for certain kinds of. Um, bring your own cannabis to to spaces. There, there is no uh, legalized kind of buy uh, one serving of cannabis to use on site in the U.S. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it hasn't happened anywhere yet. I mean, do you do you feel like uh, uh, Massachusetts could? lead on this or I don't know what kind of what are your thoughts on that as, as absolutely the... um, I have to say 2018 is an exciting year in the cannabis industry across the United States mm -hmm. um, we have new recreational markets um, like in California Massachusetts is about to go online we have new types of businesses um, Meg alluded to social consumption in different models so Denver's undertaking a pilot program where there's actually a cannabis coffee house but under the bring your own cannabis model mm -hmm. going on yeah. so there's lots of innovation in little silos across the state in a patchwork of um, differently regulated states. Um, but I'm incredibly honored and thrilled to be here, to be able to speak with you, and to be part of the conversation, frankly. Um, it's a fast-paced, rapidly evolving industry, mm -hmm. uh, but I think for those of us who are in it, it's incredibly rewarding. Yeah, fast pace. After a long period of not being fast paced, it seems like. <laughs> um. Yes, there was lots of waiting. Um, but in particularly, my perspective on that, and actually on, on the Cannabis Control Commission, I have enormous respect for them. And I think they've been incredibly transparent with posting all of the documents and minutes mm -hmm. um, up on some, in an accessible fashion on their website. I also really appreciate the mindful approach they've taken to these hard discussions. Um, for example, uh, at one point they were talking about whether or not you could smoke marijuana indoors. And so rather than just ax it, I thought it was really progressive to say, let's defer it. Let's get through our manageable hurdles right off the bat, but let's come back to this conversation because it's valid. And you can see they're really examining the different issues. I believe the social consumption issue and the delivery only models are also um, areas that are very valid conversations are having. Mm -hmm. You can see progress is happening at the policy and political level. So that's incredibly exciting. Um, few, if any, states really have the same conversation going around. So mm. we will, in Massachusetts, be the first to have recreational marijuana sales here. Um, and I think in a matter of time, we will lead in many of these exciting new kinds of businesses. Mm -hmm. mm. And waiting for the federal government to catch up with us. Um, we yeah. all hope. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting to, to envision that kind of a market. And they talk a lot about, in the cannabis, cannabis industry, about how once the individual frameworks, you know, the patchwork of regulations removed, then it'll, it'll shift more to a, a cash commodity mm -hmm. kind of a market. So for example, you may see um, large scale growing being able to be grown in like the southern or western parts of the state where naturally they have longer growing cycles and more favorable weather, and then being able to have interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. And that's another factor that limits the growth of brands such mm -hmm. as like Dixie's elixirs or, you know, different edibles and things. There's a lot of hindrance on growth because you have to apply in each and every state mm -hmm. you want to yeah. operate right hmm. so certainly um, I think it, it is exciting but um, one thing you mentioned Jeff Sessions with the rescission of the coal memo I think one thing that did instigate was the conversation um, and all of our federal uh, senators and, and representatives mm -hmm. are now having this conversation in, in facing the reality of having tax revenue coming in live time and mm. appreciating that tax revenue, but also having the difficulty that their state licensed businesses could potentially be shut down by the federal government. Maybe we should back up and just talk a little bit about oh, the yeah. coal memo. You wrote, you wrote about the coal, uh, yes, bad and um, Sessions decision. Basically, uh, an attorney general before Jeff Sessions had uh, said in a memo called the coal memo that um, even though cannabis activity and uh, possession was illegal it wouldn't um, they wouldn't be focusing on it they is the gist of it that they wouldn't be you know coming 
state by state to you know really look into it it was kind of like leaving it kind of more up to the states yeah it was kind of just you know hands off yeah um so by rescinding the coal memo uh sessions kind of said that the state attorney generals could go forward and start more actively pursuing you know uh, cannabis businesses as being criminal um on the federal level so and what what made that worse was that the attorney general in Massachusetts, Andrew Lelling, um, instead of coming out and kind of the U.S. attorney, or the, the, right? So yeah. the federal attorney in Massachusetts, yes, right. um, he, you know, uh, other U.S. attorneys in other states came out in support of the cannabis industry in their states. Lelling kind of said it's illegal. I'm not, you know, if you're doing illegal activity, like you're we could come after you basically Mm -hmm. um and since that time he's backed off a little bit and said that the opioid crisis is more on his mind than cannabis than the cannabis industry so you know i think that was a little relaxing for a lot of people but largely they were disappointed in in lulling for not saying you know your republican governor has come around your your attorney uh Mar Healy, or Attorney General, has come around to the cannabis thing. People who weren't on the, uh, weren't pro question four have since, you know, kind of supported the industry because they see the support it has statewide. And yet, our U.S. Uh, representative was still kind of falling behind. So. Yeah, yeah. You question for the um, the question that legalized uh, recreational, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. May I make a little quick comment, actually, yeah. about the timing? I think it's interesting, while Meg's talking about the timing of the ro- the rescission of the coal memo and the impact, um, and we were just talking about the CCC, reg- CCC regulations being formed, um, it's interesting the impact that that event in late December, when Jeff Sessions made that announcement, had the subsequent event in January upon the regulations in that process. Mm. Um, that's, for example, when we started to see social consumption and delivery being taken off the table. Mm. There were reports as well as a strong lobbying effort on behalf of some of the existing mm-hmm. businesses who are pushing hard. Also in concert, many others who are in the government who are supporting the cannabis industry that's in general right. came out in a very conservative swing against that, citing um, Andrew right. Lelling's statements. And so that created a reactionary fear and conservative movement in the regulatory process of the mm-hmm. recreational marijuana laws. So it just made so all these people practice. nervous and it kind of shut shut everything down, right. or not everything, but shut a bunch of stuff down that could have been, um, you know, we could have been leading on. Right. Yeah. It definitely influenced the scope of the regulations and how ambitious they were. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, does it, you know, like, do you, you were talking about it makes people uh, nervous or, uh, you know, they had been feeling relaxed and like, you know, like, you know, what were, what was your emotional state on oh my that goodness. month or? Well, I think um, in general, if someone's going to come into this industry, they can't be the faint of heart and you have to expect mm. a lot of rapid change and be able to be flexible and roll with the punches. So that said, um, I definitely actually had a plan B ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, this was one of those um, issues that it wasn't a slam dunk and certainly the regulations were in draft form. So. It could go either way, and it, there were controversial elements of it. Um, but I won't lie; it was it was like someone kicked me in the stomach. <laughs> yeah, it was very disappointing because, um, you know, we see legalized coffee houses, for example, in Amsterdam for decades with mm-hmm. no harm seemingly to their society, um, and here we are in 2018, a modern society where recreational marijuana is being legalized. So why can't we, in a fa- in some safe um, inviting fashion, roll out our own versions of that mm-hmm. or into social consumptions or other visions of that. Yeah, and it's not even like it was not just no harm. I mean, those were major tourist destinations for people going to Amsterdam. Absolutely. And I think it's important to point out, too, in the context of tourism, that tour- cannabis tourists have nowhere to go right. to mm. legally consume. So they are still left in kind of the catch-22 where they can't go in their hotels and they're not supposed to be in public you know, on bikes or trails mm-hmm. or anything um, in parks. And then they're also not supposed to be driving mm-hmm. and medicating. Um, we see in, uh, if you look at Colorado, approximately their historical rate was 4% of tourists. So if you apply that rate to Massachusetts, that's over a million people we're talking wow. about in the very first year of cannabis and tourism. So it definitely creates problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah, million people coming to East Hampton, you think? Well, <laughs> I don't know if they'll all make it out there, but one thing we're really excited about is I think, um, 
a number of us have a vision for it to become like the Emerald Corridor. Nine, we're very close to 91. That's such a soon. good name. Did you, is that your name? Or is that, that is, actually. <laughs> it's something I've been pitching since um, I've been speaking in front of the CCC all along. But I think of it in the same way that Humboldt County um, out in Colorado, oh, sorry, excuse me, in California, how the triangle of the different counties with Humboldt is known as the Emerald Triangle. Mm -hmm. We are a corridor known for our agrarian roots, mm -hmm. um, strong Massachusetts uh, marijuana connections in lore and history. Um, and I think there's a little touch of liberalism and progressiveness that is a great recipe for innovation. Um, and then, of course, in my city, 63% uh, of the people voted in favor mm. of marijuana. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a willingness to have these kinds of businesses. And I think if you look at some of the cities that are already coming out, whether it's Greenfield, uh, whether it's South Deerfield, Northampton, East Hampton, Holyoke, we're all strategically lining up and down the 91 corridor, not to mention one hour to the west is New York, down to the south is Connecticut, and mm -hmm. you know, right up to the north we're sandwiched in by Vermont. So we have a great tourism opportunity and economic stimulus opportunity here. I just think that's great. It's like we've got the Emerald Corridor, we've already got Greenfield, I don't right. know. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, like, right? like ready-made. It's a natural this. fit. Yeah. So in, what I personally would love kind of going on that is in the same way Colorado's tourism authority has embraced cannabis and right. said, let's let's forget this is here. They're actually saying, hey, let's craft a, a right. classy message mm -hmm. and use it for the dollars, you know, right. to re realize the revenue that's already coming our way. I would love to see Massachusetts have the foresight and strategically plan and work with the industries and in a very um, acceptable, palatable way, a non-offensive way, in a classy way. But certainly, um, I think that the economic impact can be so much more pronounced if the messaging and the mm. advertisement is there to back it up. Mm. Right. Yeah. I feel like that kind of leads to part of your mission, which is education. Do you want to yes. talk a little bit about you know what how you envision this your space being involved Certainly. in education? Absolutely. Well, education and um, as an extension of that, programming, mm -hmm. classes, affinity groups such as women and veteran coming together, there's many reasons um, people come together and want to around cannabis mm -hmm. culture. Specifically, I want to focus on um, the history, politics, culture. Um, and and other aspects of um, cannabis as well. You know, mm -hmm. there's so many different places you can explore. It. I'm also really interested in international use of cannabis. Mm -hmm. For example, Morocco, Jamaica, Amsterdam. These are all places that have cannabis cultures um, and vibrant societies. And so it's really interesting and I think valid to look at the art, the movies, the culture, how people interact, the anthropology um, of, of how it works in other countries. Right. And what better format than a coffee house? I mean, historically in Europe, in Paris, mm -hmm. in other areas. The coffee house was the founding, the, the birthplace of the exchange of ideas. Revolutions were formed that way, philosophers talked, scientists. So it seems only natural as a wonderful space to have the extra food and beverage service, sourced locally, of course, featuring mm -hmm. our finest delectable cuisine, but also have a fit for purpose big space where people can come together and mm -hmm. feel safe. I don't know that people have a trusted area they can go. Right now people, I think people kind of are kind of coming out as cannabis users when they go to the dispensary and they might see someone they know and some of those first impressions when someone sees a, a white collar professional or a teacher or someone, it really breaks down stigmas and stereotypes. Similarly, I would like my place to be a safe, classy place. Mm -hmm. um, and also, kind of I mentioned before with a non-cannabis user, this would be a really comfortable place for someone who just wants more information. Especially, um, I'm really committed to fact-based and experiential education. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people put a lot of claims out there and there's a lot of fear um, and a lot of anxiety. And I think that's driven by a lack of access to quality information. And I want to be a very welcoming, open area for anyone in earnest desire to learn or use cannabis or maybe down the road they're thinking about it for another family member or for someone or themselves in the life to have that space to ask questions. Um, another example too with the the veterans they were a dear population that I got to work with um, I really like them and they benefit so well but it struck me that they're very isolated mm -hmm. many times you know and that kind of leads to the cycle of feeling depressed and um, it's not good for their health Something that strikes me as a wonderful natural thing is bring them together. Why not? Under the guise and they can talk about how cannabis has affected their lives mm -hmm. um, and they need that. I think a lot of people, women too, we have many issues that are unique as women and when you get mm -hmm. together in a group um, with similar people feeling a similar way in a safe space, 
I think a lot of magic and dialogue can happen. Mm. Are there a lot of um, are there a lot of like women in the the cannabis industry that you've gotten to know? Um, there are many leaders. Um, in particular, I, I'm really um, in admiration. I have to say, of Shaleen Title on the uh, Cannabis Advisory mm-hmm. Board, and um, Chanel Lindsay as well. Excuse me, she's in the Cannabis Control Commission, yeah. and Chanel Lindsay's on um, the Cannabis Advisory Board. But they're great, wonderful, uh, strong female um, minorities who are great professionals, mm-hmm. and I think getting to see there are many women in this industry uh, cannabis is a little bit unique in that the ratios of, mm. or proportions of women and minorities are higher but that's changing and we have to pay close attention to that why is it changing because a lot of the people that are coming into this industry are more, from more traditional executive backgrounds mm. um, you know folks who are accessing capitals let me back up actually it's a really high threshold of capital to run and right. apply for a license or a business in this industry so accordingly you need those networks of finance and backing and education and oftentimes it is large majority corporate white men that are coming in and, right. and, and working on that so I think um, in hoping to keep the rates of women and minority um, active in this industry we really have to be mindful um, certainly I know for, mm-hmm. for my own organization both for we're gonna have local and diverse diversity hiring guidelines just because it makes you a better organization endemically mm-hmm. I um, in the CCC finalized regulations was a stipulation that some well it, we don't have the exact details yet but there was some allusion to the fact that they will have uh, licenses prioritized for uh, communities um, that have been worse affected by uh, the criminalization of cannabis. Do you um, feel like the the CCC is, is doing enough in that way um, to encourage you know, um, people of color to, to Absolutely. Ha- well, not just encourage, but to open the door for them given the, the, the barriers that there are. Well, I think um, it's really good to pause, even at that statement, and just realize how blessed we are that in Massachusetts Mm -hmm. and our Cannabis Control Commission is actually offering equity provisions for licensing. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any other states right now that are doing that. And if they are, it is radically new. So that in itself, as a nation, uh, at the national level rather, sets the tone as to who we are and how we operate in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of that. Um, That said, is it enough? Um, I suspect that there is going to be a wide gap between those in communities that have been disproportionately affected. Why? Because to be successful, to even get your foot in the door, you need to have a certain level of education. You need absolutely a lot of capital. It can't be the traditional sources of loans mm-hmm. and you know other, other applications like that. Um, and you need networks, strong networks. And typically in these um, communities, they are not going to have the same traditional networks that will help support these kinds of businesses. Um, you know, you also, it helps if you have family, all those kinds of socioeconomic factors that you look at, right. they all add up to, in, in aggregate, to support someone to be successful in these kinds of ventures. So what would be potential solutions or what would help bridge the gap, I think in particular, are offering education. I, I know there are provisions in the, in the CCC regulations for this. Um, they actually set um, incentive awards. You could be a social okay. justice leader in the industry, mm-hmm. kind of to promote good behavior on behalf, behalf of the um, industry uh, organizations. But um, going into these communities and offering that, but that's not enough. I mean, mm-hmm. I think you're going to need business development, maybe free hours from organizations. Mm-hmm. Out here we have Valley Ventures, um, which is a mentorship organization right. for business development, but they need those core skills. So really it's a comprehensive set of skills to get these people even in the door, let alone compete with all these other businesses that have very savvy, complex um, right. you know, marketing and right. business plans. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of work to do, but hey, it's pretty cool that we put that out there that that's our aspiration and right. that my hope is that we can meet that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that financial piece, I mean, it's, I mean, it feels like that's just like the major difference between that and all the other industries that are out there. Absolutely. It's, not, it's not seen as um, legitimate yet by the, um, the banks who have the capital. Absolutely. Um, the very valid point. Um, one point I've made to the Cannabis Control Commission, it's in my view, if there's no legitimate banking options for cannabis businesses, there's no legitimate cannabis industry. Mm-hmm. Um, in that you have to have access to for money and capital flow to be able to legitimately not launder money, to you know be transparent right. and audit, to run as a professional business. And no other industry, even liquor, 
tobacco, any of these other things, even gambling, they have access to counts. So, I mean, for example, there's extra measures we can do to be like that. Mm -hmm. You can already see there's extra bars and hurdles to jump over, but um, a way to conquer that would be an extra audit, a voluntary one, or extra measures. But still, it really is stealth mode. And honestly, if you try to operate as an open, you know, someone who is, I'm a cannabis business, you know, yeah. to operate like that, you shoot yourself in the foot and you become the disadvantaged one. And so the quiet, discreet other businesses that are professionally moving along will just blow past you. Hmm. So you have to be really clever and really mindful and look far ahead as to where you're going to go when you're going into this industry. Right. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming in. Um, maybe just as a final thought, you know, what can, what can we, uh, expect to see at a Cafe Vert, you know, in the coming future. Thank you so much for asking. Well, um, I'm really excited to announce that I'm about to launch a crowdfunding equity campaign. And so um, in putting community first, I'm going to offer before I offer to any other investors to the community members, small investment um, thresholds um, or the opportunity for small threshold investments. What does that mean? That means anybody between $100 and $5,000 can pledge through the uh, crowdfunding platform that's okay with ancillary cannabis businesses um, and can get stock and own the company. Mm -hmm. And so it's my vision that as um, businesses come in and as we profit, our community can profit too. Mm. They should get some kind of equitable access and a part of the industry because they're going to bear the brunt of the tourists, the foot traffic, you know, safety precautions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really important. Your plan has to start and end with the community. Um, and I am earnest in that endeavor. I really hope that in my mind, if all of East Hampton bought it all, uh -huh. that would be great. But <laughs> I'm capping it at Massachusetts. We're kind of having staggering stages. Um, so first, first few weeks will be East Hampton only, and then next two weeks will be Hampton and Hampshire counties, and then we'll open up to Massachusetts. But we want it to stay local. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah. So cool. Great. great. Well, great. check it out. We'll see it. Thank great. you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and don't forget to visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Thank you.